Working at a blast iron furnace was the most dangerous job you could have on the frontier in the 1700s. OSHA? What's that? Workers' comp? No way. Not in the iron furnaces of the frontier. Have a look. Iron was needed everywhere in the frontier, along with some I-can-do-anything blacksmiths like James Rumsey, who were also needed to hammer the iron into many useful forms, such as rods to be made into chains, tools, pickaxes, and other axes, or sheet metal to be shaped into plows, or you name it. Now, if you worked in an iron furnace in those days, you could have had many different jobs. For starters, you could have been the one who dug the iron ore right out of the ground. Or you could have been the one who loaded it onto a wagon, which would take it then to a mill where it was ground into smaller pieces. Or you might be one of the people chopping down a five-foot diameter oak or hickory with your broad axe. Or you might be one of the workers returning to that fallen tree three months later when it was drier and you began driving your axe into the convenient splits that appeared in the wood after it dried. And when you were done, you had a huge pile of billets of wood, about four feet long and about as wide as your arm, the prime ingredient to make charcoal. Now here's the dangerous part. You might be a collier. Yes, a collier, that's what they were called and you stacked these billets of wood into a pyramid and left a crawling space with which in you could crawl and light the entire pyramid inside. This took a brave soul, you no doubt. So you lit the pile and you scurried out from inside before you were burnt toast or bacon. This massive smoldering wood pile would then be covered with almost a foot of earth all over and around and the days of the long, slow cook began, with temperatures rising to 2,000 degrees. A few vents around the middle of the, or the waist of the mound, would give air to the fire. Now, God help you at this stage of the job. You might be the unfortunate, brave soul that you are, who had to, at one point, ascend some stairs, fox-like, up upon the mound and close those vents. And yes, it did happen. Sometimes a collier fell through the fragile earthen shell to a terrible death in a 10-foot deep mass of 2,000 degree fire. Charcoal in the making. You might be one of those people who carried wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow of limestone to the mill for crushing under its millstone, which in turn was driven by a nearby creek, which turned the grist mill, which created its ponderous power to pulverize your limestone offerings. A similar process was carried out with the raw iron ore, which was carried to a mill where it was broken down into smaller pieces. Now, the big event. The big event Hey, we're going to have a blast. Yeah, a blast. You would be one of many carrying wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow, 15 tons of ingredients to dump into the bottomless stack of the blast furnace. Alternating 8-inch layers of crushed lime, crushed roasted iron ore, and the now-ready charcoal. This all filled the furnace to nearly two-thirds its capacity. Now, this ritual usually was once a day at operations with, say, 500 workers, like the operation at Antietam Ironworks along the Potomac near Shepherdstown. Then this huge source of heat and energy was lit. There would be two huge bellows that pumped air through the base of the furnace, providing air to this huge purifying crucible, making the contents white-hot making flames climb high into the sky. These flames soared up into the night, out of the stack, and black smoke belched infernally, 
as the material inside slowly burnt down into the furnace's bowels. Hours go by, and then, of the 15 tons, there is only about five tons left of slag or waste and three tons of molten iron ready to be poured off. And so we're ready to do just that. A vast, slightly sloping, carefully graded field of sand is at the foot of the iron-filled furnace. A carefully dug trench in the sand had maybe 30 huge molds on each side of the trench and each with a down sloping feed sluice directing the molten iron to flow from the furnace opening into the trench and then branching off into each of these 30 or so molds being filled with pig iron. Get it? Like pigs at the trough. Each mold of pig iron would weigh, when cooled, about two or three hundred pounds, just the right size for two strong men to lift it onto a wagon and take it to where it had to go, the ferry or to the town. Now you, being braved and skilled, you might be the one who had to reach with a long pole into the base of the furnace and jigger free that plug, freeing this molten hot iron out into the world. Of course, if you do it wrong, everybody gets sprayed or covered with molten iron, or there might be a little gas explosion. It's a job, right? And so it goes. The furnace burns on and on after you have skillfully replugged it, keeping the heat for immediate refueling and ready for another load. <laughs>